Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, today, what I'm trying to do is give you a bit of an idea of what I spent the last three and a half years of my life doing with my PhD. Um, bearing in mind that you're not all weed people, let alone even ecologists, I've tried to keep it at quite a high level. But I'm concerned that I've tried to put so much stuff in in insufficient detail that none of it will make sense. So we'll see how we go. Um, the title of my thesis is Exploring the Ecological Intensification of Weed Management in South African Cropping Systems. Hopefully what that means will become clear as we go on. So today I'm going to talk to you about all of these pieces of my PhD, what weeds are, what ecological intensification is, why, why was I in South Africa, what happens there, um, the three practical case studies that were my PhD data chapters, um, and then what I think it all means for the future, that's a big claim, isn't it, the future of weed research. Um, and then at the end, a little bit on the impact that I hope I might have had, and a little update on what I'm doing now. Um, so starting with what a weed is, um, the easiest definition for a weed is a plant out of place. W it's an anthropogenic um, definition. We decide when a plant is out of place. It's when it does something that interferes with what we want to do. So in agriculture, it obviously interferes with our ability to produce as much food as we might like to. Um, the one part of the definition that is less anthropogenic is when the species are alien species, so they've come from a, another country, and they get out of control in a new one. They can then cause problems both for people, so you know, weeds from America are as much of a problem in agriculture here as a weed from the UK, um, but they can also threaten natural ecosystems, so then your weed is out of place twice. Um, but in, in agriculture, which is what my thesis is on, not in natural systems, the big worry is that they reduce crop yields. They are one of the biggest limits to crop production. If you don't control weeds, they can reduce yields by 35%, which is more than either pests or pathogens will do. Um, to get around that limit, we try and dig weeds out of the ground using mechanised tillage or spray them with herbicides. People spend $20 billion a year on 1.2 tonnes of herbicide. It's 1.2 million tonnes of herbicide. So that's a lot of chemical going onto the land around the world. As I'm sure you guys all know, there are big problems with those two approaches. Herbicides are novel chemicals in the environment. They mess with things that aren't adapted to living with them, including humans. Um, they can kill other plants, not just what they're sprayed on, so they can have even non-target effects on other crops, which is not just ecologically problematic, but economically problematic. Um, and tillage makes soil go to places that soil's not supposed to go to. So it ends up in rivers and in the atmosphere instead of on your farm. The other problem with weed control is that weeds play really positive roles in agroecosystems, particularly to support farmland biodiversity. So declines in farmland birds across the UK, for example, are strongly linked to declines in weeds. And that's regardless of the impacts that herbicides and tillage have just had, have had on other aspects of the ecosystem. It's just when there's no weeds, there's no birds. So maybe we want to keep some weeds to support the birds, and they can also provide functions that are useful to the farmer as well in terms of soil quality. <coughs> but the root of the problem with all of these, or the root of the problems with weed management, is all weed control, weed, conventional weed control just tries to remove weeds, just so that there's no weeds and they won't compete with the crop. It doesn't take into account what happens in the future to those weeds that you've been trying to control. It doesn't take into account what happens to the soil, what happens to any other organism, including human consumers who come into contact with the herbicides. So um, that's what I just said. We don't consider the interactions. You change one part of the system, you knock everything else out of place, you have effects that you don't intend. So what we need to do with the way we farm and weed management, as with any other aspect of farming, is think of the whole system. And agriculture is its applied ecology. It's a bunch of organisms interacting with the environment, so we need to understand the ecology of the system in order to manage it sustainably. Uh, which is the idea behind ecological intensification. If we understand the ecology, we can replace things that we try to do with inputs with natural functions of ecosystems. So instead of trying to remove weeds with um, chemicals and with tillage, can we create ecosystems that are inherently resilient to those weeds being there and that inherently limit their growth? So to do this, we can use natural ecosystems as a blueprint, so we can look at how um, forest systems operate and how the populations of different species uh, you know, do change or don't change in response to which conditions and processes. And then we can think, can we apply that to the way we farm? Um, and the other advantage of using this approach is that you, if you're working with the natural world to produce your food, 
you can't push the natural world beyond its limits, otherwise it stops working, and it stops working for you. So it reduces the chances that there'll be strong environmental impacts, <coughs> because that would be counterproductive to farming. So there's loads of evidence now that agricultural systems that work out how to mimic ecosystem functions are using a lot of diversity, setting up different trophic levels, all of these things can um, increase yield and yield stability through creating more resilient systems that are less vulnerable to shocks. Um, it can reduce expenses for farmers because if you're not buying a herbicide because you've set up your system so you don't need to, that's more money that you keep in your pocket. Um, it can help to sustain on-farm biodiversity because you're no longer doing so many damaging things. And it reduces the um, impacts associated with those inputs. So if you create a fertilizer, there's a huge carbon footprint you put it on the land, it leaches out, and then you have pollution as well at the end of it. So if you're not using those things, everything stays in the system, there's less um, impacts on the environment. The problem with ecological intensification is it's not easy. Like, uh, if you imagine that you farm a vast wheat monoculture, quite how you start diversifying that system or quite where your first ecosystem processes would come from is not obvious. Um, and also, depending on your farming system, on which crops will grow there, on your environment, on which other organisms are in it, you're going to have different solutions um, that are environment and context specific. So we can't just say, you know, this is how you do ecological intensification everywhere. We need to go to all these different places and work out which tricks work for which farming systems. We can generate rules of thumb, and the more we do these different experiments in different places, hopefully the better we get at coming up with general rules that are starting points for everyone. So if we think about it with weeds, um, the first thing we want to know is what are those ecosystem processes that we could use? Um, what governs weed population growth? What, what encourages them to keep growing through a field of crops and cause problems? Or what stops them from doing that? Um, what is the relationship between weeds and crops? Do they compete more in different conditions and less than others? Um, and how do we get positive effects from weeds? Are different weeds more positive than others? Or again, is it related to the conditions? And then when we understand those properties and processes, how do we then design, how do we use them to design systems that are resilient to weeds? I've said resilient a few times now. And we use this term because it implies a, a system that self-regulates against the, a disturbance. So if the disturbance is weeds, weeds are arriving, we want that system to do things that stop the weeds causing a problem by itself. We don't want to have to come in with herbicides and tractors and plows. We want parts of the system to prevent those weeds from spreading. So the first, this is a little weeds 101, the first um, thing that we understand when we're looking at um, plant populations increasing is the life cycle of a plant. Um, so plants increase and they successfully go from seeds to seedlings to mature plants and produce more seeds, which produces more seedlings, more adult plants, more seeds, yes? So if you interrupt that cycle, you reduce the population, and if that cycle's not interrupted, it keeps going. So there's lots of different things that can happen to the plants at different, maybe this font's too small, at different points of their life cycle, but things like um, being eaten while they're growing can reduce how many of them survive to adulthood, can reduce the seeds that they're able to produce, and things like being decomposed at the seed stage stops those seeds surviving. So when we're talking about weed control, what we tend to do at the moment is mostly chemical or mechanical control of the plants that have sprouted. So we're either spraying them or burying them. Plowing buries seeds, so it takes seeds from the surface and puts them deep down where they're less able to germinate. And to some extent, we use competitive crops. And then some people have started bringing in these harvest weed seed destructors. So when the grain is harvested, any weed seeds that are caught up in that magically get separated into some part of the combine and ground to find dust. But if you look at this picture, <laughs> There's lots of things that we don't do to weeds. They have loads of, if you get something that can survive, so let's say it's herbicide resistant, there's very little other things that are going to happen to that weed in its life on a farm. Um, and one of the reasons that is true is because farms are, the conventional farms are inherently simple systems. So they lack things, um, so they, I think that one's first, yeah. So they lack other organisms that would naturally regulate plant populations. So if you have a monoculture, um, or wheat plants, they use the environment around them in the same way, that can leave gaps for weeds to get in there. 
you're spraying off all of the herbivores so they don't eat your wheat. That means there's nothing to eat the weeds either. Um, there's still no competition when the weeds are producing seeds. There's probably very few seed predators because you've been spraying insecticides to keep them away from your crops. And so there's just, you know, if the weeds survive the weed control, nothing will stop them. Agroecosystems are also very, well, typically very high in resources. So they're fertilized, they're irrigated, canopies have been cleared. So there's lots of light, water, and nutrients, which is exactly what plants need to survive. And if those things are not being used up by the crop, which typically they're not all being used up by, there's lots available for weeds. So they're not experiencing any stress because they've got everything they need all the time. So this tells us that, yeah, it's not just the weed that's a problem, it's the way we farm that is causing the weeds to be a problem. So that gives us a different angle to think about when it comes to weed management. But it is also worth considering that not all weeds are the same. Different weeds respond differently to different things. So, you know, you might have some weeds that are particularly sensitive at the seed stage and other weeds that are easier to target as they reach maturity before they produce seeds. So it then becomes important to understand which weeds you have on your farm, why they're there, and which ones are going to respond to management in different ways. So to do this, we can use the filtering metaphor, which is the idea that of all the possible species that could arrive at your site, only a subset will do so, because some of them will be prevented from arriving there, like if there's no, if they need an animal to move the seeds and that animal doesn't exist in the farming system, they won't get to the field. Uh, not all species can survive in all environments, so not all species can survive tillage. Some can, but you won't, on a tilled field, you won't get the species that can't. And then when the species all get together in a group, they interact with each other and they can facilitate, so they can increase each other's survival or they can decrease each other's survival. And so, obviously, the types of crops that you have also affect which types of weeds can then grow amongst them. I think, yeah, so I'm going to illustrate that in a more applied agricultural sense. So let's say you have some weeds, thistles and dandelions, as an example, and maybe you use a single strong, yeah, okay, maybe I'll explain that very quickly here, um, is that the idea, the stronger these filters are, the more species they prevent from arriving. So if you occasionally do a little bit of shallow tillage, some species that don't really like tillage will probably still survive, but if you intensively do deep ploughing, no species that don't like tillage will survive. So you'll get fewer species arriving. So if you have strong filters, you end up with a very low species diversity. And if you have weaker filters, you'll end up with a higher species diversity. However, what I want to explain is that a weaker filter doesn't necessarily mean less abundance. So if you have a, let's say you go for a single strong filter, you're gonna spray a whole bunch of herbicides at once. One filter, boom. What happens is your dandelions happen to be herbicide resistant. So you might kill your thistles, but there's nothing that stops the dandelions growing if they're resistant to that filter. On the other hand, let's say you graze first, sheep quite like dandelions, they disappear, and then you mow at the right time of year to knock back the thistles. You don't kill either of those, but both of them are knocked back. What happens then is, so you've got the weaker filters permit more diversity, strong filters eliminate diversity, but don't necessarily stop abundance of adapted species. And then as that system goes on, no matter how many herbicides you spray, the dandelions get out of hand. Whereas because both these species are somewhat sensitive to the weaker filters, you end up with less of them, but more diversity. So we can sort of extrapolate this into a general rule. The more diversity of filters you have on a population of plants, you would expect the diversity of those plants to go up, but the abundance of everything to be limited at some point, so the overall quantity of everything to be limited. Um. So that's useful to know in that if you want a uh, higher weed diversity, which tends to link to higher diversity at other trophic levels, and it looks prettier, there's more flowers, um, you can manage your filters around that, and we also know that if it explains why herbicides don't always work, in that some species can be resistant, but there's nothing that then limits their abundance. But it also raises the question of, okay, we know that different filters act differently on different species. Does that mean that we can use them to select for nice weeds? Can we have weeds that are less competitive, that are particularly valuable to some rare local butterfly? And uh, the answer is yes. 
And I'm going to give you an example based on life history strategies, which I think is very relevant to weeds and agricultural systems in general. This is probably a complicated looking diagram. Um, but what this is, is if you take everybody's research on plants and you put them together, you get this picture. So there's um, plants tend to adapt to different ways of using resources. You can either be in, if you're in a low resource environment, you can't capture very many resources very quickly, so you can't grow very quickly, but you become very conservative of those resources, because once you've collected them, you want to keep them. On the other hand, if you're a weed in a fertilized, irrigated agricultural field, all of the resources are always available until somebody else competes for them, so you want to grow as fast as you can, as big as you can. And so you get this um, first dimension, where you get species that in high resource um, areas, things will grow very fast, and in um, low resource areas, things grow a bit slower. There's a lot of plant traits that are related to these. I don't think I need to go into all the detail. But so it's fast plants and slow plants, and then you also have disturbance as another um, thing, another constraint on the system. So a disturbance is something that um, causes mortality or reduces the survival of, of a population. And so if you have regular disturbances, that fast strategy is encouraged even more because things want to grow and produce a lot of seeds so that it doesn't matter if they survive the disturbance or not, their seeds are out there and they'll grow after the disturbance. If you have less disturbance, it encourages the slow strategy more. So what we end up with is plants that do different things in different environments. Probably in agricultural systems, species that are slow, so species that don't grab lots of resources quickly, we would expect them to be less competitive with crops. So these are probably the weeds that we want in general. At the moment, we have very high resource, high disturbance systems for arable ecosystems. So things are always being sprayed off or tilled, so that encourages fast species that use all these resources. And even in perennial systems, so like an orchard or a vineyard, the disturbance might be lower, but there's still a lot of irrigation and fertilization that goes on. So we tend to get weeds that opposite, occupy this opposite spectrum to the ones that we think would actually be more easier to cope with on farms. I hope that makes sense. Um, so that was a little introduction to all the things we can think about when we're thinking about weeds. Um, do we apply that in weed management already? To some extent, yes, we do. So there's this idea of integrated weed management, which is based around crop rotation. So if you rotate crops, you rotate the pressures those crops apply to weeds each year. You rotate the management associated with those crops that applies different pressures. And that has that effect of reducing the chances that any species will encounter favorable conditions every year, but also reducing the chances that any species will be so affected every year that it becomes extinct. So you should arrive at that nice situation I explained before where you have a relatively high diversity of weeds but a relatively low abundance of all species. So when we integrated weed management is applied well, it is the best weed management strategy that we have. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to do. It's often implemented badly. So a lot of cropping systems are constrained by what farmers can sell or what farmers think they can sell. So if you're stuck with three crops and you don't want to till um, integrated weed management tends to become integrated herbicide management, and that's not enough. It's not enough difference between different years. Things start building up resistance to lots of herbicides, and you lose out. So we know that in principle it works, but in practice it's difficult. Competitive crops, where they are used to some extent. However, it's not because people assume that weed control will occur on farms. It's not always a main aim of breeding. Um, so you'll get weed crops that are bred to be very vulnerable to competition. And functions of crops are sometimes trade-offs. So if you've got something like a legume and you want it to produce a lot of nitrogen, that the way it uses resources to feed its bacteria to do that may reduce its competitive ability against weeds. So you can't, they're not, they're not the answer to everything, competitive crops. Um, people try to get around that by putting more different crops on a field to use up all those spare resources. This is what we call intercropping. Um, it's a really nice idea. So you say you plant, you know, you have your rows of wheat and you have clover between them using that space that weeds might use, but providing a more positive function than your average weed might do. But it's, people really struggle getting them going. You d it's hard to know which species will grow well together in which environments. 
So fundamentally, we do these things. When they work, they work well, but we need better, a, a better understanding of when they work and how they work. And we probably want some more ideas as well on how we can add more aspects of the system um, to create these conditions that uh, confer resilience to weeds. So for my thesis, I took all this thinking and uh, went down to this very far corner of Africa here, which is Cape Town's on this little pointy bit, Ooh, which you've seen in the second. Um, and so this is the winter rainfall region of South Africa. Um, it looks like this, or the farming systems look like this. So they are very monotonous landscapes. Um, all the trees you can see there are not even native. They're mostly those pesky Australian gum trees, Michael. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> um, they do do a bit of crop rotation. So you can see in the background here canola, and he uh, here in the front a grazed forage of annual medics. And vineyards are, and orchards are also very big in this region, main farming systems. Um, it's a Mediterranean climate, so there's no rain in summer. It gets really hot. So this is what the farm looks like in summer, and that's the same farm in winter. So that introduces challenges. Um, the area also has very fragile soils, and partly because they're left bare in summer, people are really loath to disturb them in any way. So no tillage has become very popular um, in this region, or conservation agriculture, which is the idea that you combine no-till with crop residue management and crop rotation. Um, but that brings its problems because tillage is then no longer an option for weed control, so you're really stuck with herbicides if you're a conventional farmer. Um, the area used to be this amazing floral landscape that still exists in some of the mountains, but in the lowland area, there's very, very little left. So it would be nice if agricultural systems could coexist with this more. Um, but yeah, what you have are these huge farms. Um, it's mostly commercial large-scale farms. For those of you who know a bit about South Africa and its history, this is one of the more economically valuable areas. So there's very little smallhold farming because of who got hold of the land when. Equally, these are probably the guys doing all the environmental damage, like smallholders on small areas. Probably less of a problem if we're talking about less tillage, less herbicides, and the effects that has on the environment. Um, there are no farm subsidies and there's very little regulation or no enforced regulation. So that means farmers basically can do what they want and they tend to be quite profit driven because they're commercial farms. So they maybe sometimes use herbicides in ways that they shouldn't. We certainly have a lot of herbicide resistance now. So this is uh, lolium or ryegrass, um, which is one of the most herbicide resistant weeds in the world. And there are, that was a vineyard that said they'd run out of herbicides. Nothing worked on it anymore. And that's what the plants looked like, despite being sprayed with whatever the guys could get their hands on. However, despite this sort of like free for all, no regulation system, the farms, are, and even though the farms are big, they still tend to be family businesses. And there's this big culture with the Afrikaners and their connection to the land. So there's a surprising amount of openness to more sustainable practices. And linked to that is the fact that they talk to each other a lot. So they have these strong networks and they're all linked to academics and as well the industry. But it means that if you, you know, people are interested in talking and if you come up with something that works, it can be quite easy to spread the message around. So an example of that is that conservation, the whole area converted to conservation agriculture in the space of 20 years, which is in terms of farmers adopting new practices is pretty quick. So that seems like a good opportunity. Um, so in this area, the main problems with weed management are herbicide resistance, um, environmental impacts from those herbicides, and from, if you till, the impacts of soil erosion. There's a limited number of crop species and tools available um, because there's not that many things that will grow in a Mediterranean climate, and there's not that many things that the seed companies offer them. Um, and we would really like it if the farms could become more positive for the natural environment in terms of biodiversity. Um, and ecosystem functioning that will protect those natural environments. So I picked three things for my thesis that I thought were relevant to that paradigm and went out to investigate them. The first one was looking at can you have nice weeds in vineyards so that farmers do less horrible things to try and get rid of the weeds. The second was can you use livestock instead of tillage in conservation agriculture systems to add in a different pressure to weeds so that you can reduce the reliance on herbicides. 
And can we use cover crops in those systems or in vineyards as a more kind of ecologically functional and environmentally friendly way of suppressing weeds? So I hope all of that background makes sense till now. I'm now going to run through the three data chapters, which there is a lot of technical stuff behind them, but I don't want to go into it. So I'm going to go through them quite quickly. If anyone starts to look really lost, I'll try and slow down and explain more, but hope it'll make sense. So this is the first one um, on using management to influence which weeds you have. So can we influence, um, can we get nice weeds? So like if you look at this picture, but maybe it's not very clear, I took it lying down in the grass. Those weeds are all very short. There's lots of different species, there's lots of flowers, and none of those are particularly problematic um, in that system. So this was the idea. Um, if you weeds cause problems for crops, even for vineyards, particularly in water-stressed uh, semi-arid climates. But if you try and control those weeds all the time, you're, it's bad for your soils, um, which in, can affect your production in the future, and it's also bad for the surrounding environment. So can we promote basically better weeds, ones that cause less harm to crops um, and have more positive functions so that you reduce the amount you need to control them and you can maximize the conservation value of your farm. <coughs> um, this is what we think a beneficial weed community would look like. So you would basically want weeds that cover more ground and with which there is more diversity, because if you have more cover and more ground, you get more resources, more habitat for more biodiversity. In general, that's not really, having cover in vineyards isn't really a problem when it's raining in the winter, but when you hit summer, then the weeds and the grapevines are going to start to compete for water. So whilst that might be good for biodiversity, it's also going to make the weeds more competitive. In terms of the attributes of different weeds, I have down here three functional traits that are related to the life history strategy thing that I showed you before. So generally we consider that tall weeds that produce lots of small seeds and that sort of produce large, cheap, cheap leaves, these are fast species, so they're just all about growing, grabbing resources to produce as much seed as possible, as quickly as possible. So we'd expect those to be competitive because they're keen on taking those resources. And when the resources are in the weed, they're not available to the crop. <coughs> and then I, we went out and had a look around what vineyards do to manage their weeds to give us an idea of what we could look at in terms of the different management practices and the different weeds that might result from that. And basically, we have some weeds that are, have different management strategies. So some weeds, some farmers <laughs> that have different management strategies. Some are organic, some are full-on conventional, and some can't quite manage organic but don't like using too many herbicides or too many other pesticides. Um, but then on all of these, they all use a different range of ways to manage weeds, whether it's tillage, mowing, or herbicides. There's obviously no herbicides for the organic guys. So I went out around this area, surveyed some different blocks on some different people's farms, you know, <coughs> fancy split plot design. The vineyards all look really different. So, you know, you get some people who mow, it's all short, these guys who spray and still can't get rid of their ryegrass. Uh, I think, I can't what they did. They were growing co cover crops already, so. Um, yeah, and then what I did was I took all those samples from all those sites. This is an ordination of the weed community. So. Based on, this is a mathematically magical way of showing you that based on the types of species on each site, this diagram shows you how similar they are to each other or how different they are. And so what this shows up is that all the pale circles are organic systems managed by mowing, and all of the dark triangles are conventional systems managed with herbicides. So you can see that you do get very different weed communities. The only species I'll point out here is lol or lolium which is the, uh, the um, ryegrass that's really hard to manage with herbicides because it comes resistant, becomes resistant very quickly, and you can see that it's strongly associated with that conventional herbicide management. So if, you don't, if you're having problems with your lolium, maybe you shouldn't be spraying more herbicides, maybe you should be switching management. There's a circle to highlight that. Um, this is the same picture, but what it shows you is some environmental variables and management overlaid. So should show up, yeah, at the top, you probably can't see it from there, but we have more fertile soils and more rain, and at the bottom is sort of dry, sandy soils. So that shows you that the variation in this diagram 
in this direction, up to bottom, is explained by a difference in soil fertility and, and water. So you'll get different weeds that are adapted to those different conditions. But the second dimension, which is the first one, axis one, is, uh, is all caused by management. So over here are the mowing um, practices, tillage was a bit lower down in the middle, and then sprayed ones off to this side. So there's a huge amount of variation in that community that's explained by those management practices, which suggests that yes, you can use management to determine which species you'll have. This one shows you the, those aspects of the weed community that I suggested were more or less beneficial to vineyards. And basically what you end up with is this, there's more cover and more diversity up here. So this is our beneficial for the um, uh, other biodiversity weeds. So generally in the mown organic systems. And you tend to get more competitive weeds, so they're taller. With, so SLA is this measure of how big and cheap your leaf is. They tend to be more up here. Oops. So you are sort of getting, yeah, um, in your sprayed systems, you're getting competitive weeds. In your mown systems, you are getting beneficial weeds. If we then looked at those direct relationships, basically these plots make it clear that there's more weed, more winter weed cover in sites with an M under them, so mown. If you really were worried about that summer weed cover, so remember I said summer weed cover is good for biodiversity, but it can cause problems for, um, for vineyards, then tillage, any tilled site, was, had much lower summer weed cover. The herbicide sites didn't achieve that so well, probably because it's herbicide resistance. And also, interestingly, the um, tillage didn't reduce the number of native species, even if it did reduce the total abundance, whereas herbicides did. And tilled sites didn't reduce diversity as much as sprayed sites did. So if you are really worried about those summer weeds and you want one way of controlling them, herbicides don't seem to be the way to go because they're more harmful and less effective. Um, and then they also promote taller weeds, which are really annoying on vineyards because they're much harder to manage. So the findings from that study were that mowing makes nice weed communities, herbicides makes annoying weed communities, and if you do need to limit your weed cover, then tillage is the least harmful way of doing that. That's partly because mowing is a relatively weak filter. It doesn't kill all species. It allows more to survive, so you get more diversity. But it does select against tall species, which are problematic. And it encourages species that are better at, they're not those fast species that grab lots of resources and grow big, because they need to conserve resources underground so they can re-sprout after mowing. Herbicides are a strong filter to anything that's not adapted to survive them. Um, but they're not effective against the lowly and the ones that are. So, whoops, yes, management can be used to filter for more desirable communities. And in the Western Cape, we think if people focused on mowing as their main weed control, everyone would be happier. Interestingly, everyone mows their vineyards in New Zealand. So um, maybe that <laughs> indicates something. That was the first chapter, the first part of the project. Um, this is the second one. It's quite different. I think advice to any, no one, there's not that many new PhD students. Uh, don't try and solve all of a region's weed problems in one PhD, it's a terrible idea. Um, so from vineyards and mowing and herbicides over to arable systems with sheep in them. So this one was looking at crop rotation. So the other one was looking at different types of management. This looks at what happens if you put different crops and management together over time. The idea behind crop rotation is, I explained it for integrated weed management already, change the conditions each year. You don't kill everything every year, but you limit everything at least at some point. What was interesting here is that in, we've not in the past really been sure how much the different crops affect the weeds and how much the different management associated with the different crops affects the weeds. And this trial provided a nice way of looking at that. So this was a, a nice thing to happen in my PhD, which was that somebody gave me a lot of long-term data from an old trial. I didn't have to do any field work myself. It's a really cool trial. So they have four cash cropping systems from monoculture wheat down to where wheat is rotated with lupins and canola. And then they have systems where wheat is rotated with grazed forage phases. So they grow annual medix, sometimes mixed with clover, and they put the sheep out on those fields. So we're a Mediterranean climate, we can't grow anything in summer, so everything's grown in winter, so it's one crop per year. These are four-year systems. Um, and we had data for 
yeah, since we had data for weeds since 2005, so that was 12 years of data at the point that I did this. Um, this data was collected by taking soil samples from each field, and you grow them up in the greenhouse and you count how many of each species come up. I didn't do that, other people did, very nice of them. But then we were interested from that trial, was it the crop diversity or was it the management? So the herbicides they were applying, how much, what types, how much fertilizer was going on there, um, and whether there were other sources of nitrogen, so from legumes which fix nitrogen, or the livestock cycling nitrogen back in. Gosh, I'm still talking, and I've got a lot to do. Anyway, what this gave us was four crop-only systems, four crop and livestock systems, a range of crop diversities in both systems, but this, herbis uh, this management in the crop-only system is pretty much all based around herbicides, so a lot of fertilizers, and so all of your nitrogen pretty much comes from fertilizers. These ones, um, they use herbicides in the cash crop years, but they graze and, and use very little herbicide in the forage years, and then less fertilizer goes on because you've got the legumes and the sheep doing their things. So we were able to compare management diversity and crop diversity on this trial. What we found out for weeds was, if you look at the coloured circles, that in the cash crop systems, the yellow ones, weed abundance was much higher. This is a log scale, so in the field it was much, much higher. I'll show you on the next slide how much. And uh, weed diversity was lower in these systems as well. Um, something else is going to show up. And then crop diversity within the different management classes had a small effect. So more diverse systems tended to have lower weed abundance and more weed diversity. The effect was not as much as the grazing. So here are some complicated plots to show the same thing. As um, crop rotation diversity goes up, then weed, which one's which? Weed abundance goes down. But in the grazed sites, these are the pale sites, it goes down more. So grazing increases the effect that crop diversity has on the weeds. So if your, if your crop diversity is associated with a change in management, that's more effective for weed control than just changing crops. Overall, from all the results in the study, what we found was that systems that had a high crop diversity and grazing and a high nitrogen resource diversity had these nice weed communities where there were less weeds, and they were more picky. And uh, they were, had less than five seeds per metre squared for ryegrass in these ones, which means it was total weeds, forgotten now. And in the monoculture wheat, for example, there was uh, more than 150 seeds per metre squared. So that gets, shows you the massive difference that that management and the crop diversity made on the weed community. And monocultures had more herbicides applied and more fertilizers applied. Um, so they had lots of nasty weeds. Very quickly, this also shows you, this is another ordination, that in the crop only or the yellow circles, the weeds were almost always the same two, maybe three weeds. And in the other ones, they had a much bigger range of different species, some of which were native. So crop diversity is good. Uh, management diversity is even better. Something that was very interesting for this is people will often try and tell you that if you use different types of herbicide because they affect different plants in different ways, that is management diversity. This trial proved that it's not. So there are lots of species that have morphological adaptations to stop herbicides getting into them. They tend to be tolerant of almost all herbicides regardless of what the active chemical is. So that was nice to show. Um, and the fertilizers may also have played a role. It was a little hard to untangle that because high herbicide systems are also high fertilizer systems. More research to be done. If we look at the yields, the yields were also highest in the graze systems um, and generally higher in the diverse systems, whereas in the monoculture, they were much lower. Um, somebody else did some research on the profitability as well. And because if you can sell lamb in a bad wheat year and wheat in a bad lamb year, then um, your farm incomes remain higher. You're spending less on herbicides, you're spending less on fertilizers, so you're generally winning at life. The farm's more profitable. Um, and it's better for the environment because you're putting less crap on your farm that had a really high carbon footprint. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the final investigation I did. This is the one that took all the field work time. Um, we mixed together cover crops to see if different mixes are better or not for weed control, weed suppression. Why did we want to do that? Um, cover crops are great. They do lots of cool things. Um, they provide habitat for biodiversity. They encourage soil nutrient cycling. Uh, they can limit pests and diseases. So we really want farmers to use them 
but farmers do complain that sometimes cover crops let a lot of weeds in. Um, so we wanted to see if we could design one that didn't. And we, I mean, in South Africa, they really need things that work for lolium. Not everyone wants to have sheep, so maybe a cover crop would be helpful for them. Um, so by now you should have picked up that there's competition for resources between crops and weeds. Um, we wanted to make these crops more competitive. Um, and so I borrowed some theory from invasion ecology, which is that if you have more diverse systems with more species um, capturing resources from their environment in different ways, there should, that should result in a greater total resource capture so that there's less resources left, less kind of gaps for the weeds to get in and use. So we would expect the diverse community to be more resistant to weeds. To illustrate that, um, if you imagine that those funny green triangles are crop tops and crop roots, um, if you have some gaps between them, some little weeds will get in. Hello. Um, and if you have bigger gaps between them, more weeds will get in. So more resources, more weeds. Biometric resistance, if you have lots of crops that try and use the resource in the same ways around them, that leaves gaps. Ugh. If you have a diverse mix of species with different growth forms, maybe they leave smaller gaps so you don't get weeds, or you don't get so many weeds. Um, so if we apply this to cover crops, we imagine that a, uh, any cover crop that captures resources effectively will suppress weeds effectively, and we would imagine that a functionally diverse mix, so things that do different things in different ways, be more likely to capture resources more effectively. So I took all the species we could find for, that you can grow on farms, which were mostly cereals, legumes, and brassicas. Uh, these types generally have generally similar growth habits to each other that are generally different from the different groups. So cereals are quite tall. They have fibrous roots that hang out on the surface of the soil a lot. Legumes spread across the top of the ground more. And brassicas tend to be more straight up and more straight down. So if you mix them together, we would imagine that they capture more resources, whereas if you put them in their own types, there's going to be gaps. That's kind of the idea in the field. So you've got all these different leaf shapes. Maybe they cover more ground than just the grass would by itself. If you look at it this way, if you've got tall things and then short things, um, then hopefully there's less light reaching the soil that weeds can use. So I mixed up lots of species in lots of ways. We put some of them, the same species of the same type all together, different species of the same type all together. And then we would also put different species of different types all together. So I was able to check whether it's species diversity or functional type diversity um, that was important. Did this on two farms. It was all nicely statistically replicated. Big plot. Um, we did it for two years. We collected some data about what resources those crops were using in the soil and how much ground they were covering for light capture. We would cut them and measure them to see how much crop biomass versus how much weed biomass there was. Calculated some diversity indices. And at the end of the year, we rolled them flat, which is an organic way of terminating your cover crops. Um, and we planted cash crops after that to see what the effect of cover crop plots that had more or less weeds in them then had on the cash crops. Um, this is what the, weed, the cover crops looked like. They were very pretty. Um, that was the legume mix was probably the nicest looking mix. Unfortunately, it wasn't a beauty contest. It was a weed suppression contest. So here's what happened. Um, this is the BG for bare ground, so this is where we, we planted nothing, left the ground bare and just saw what weeds would come up. Unsurprisingly, they had the most weeds. Somewhat surprisingly and disappointingly, all of the legume mixes also had lots of weeds. They were not necessarily even statistically different from the bare ground plot in the terms of the amount of weeds, so no, that wasn't great. Um, on the other hand, the cereal mixes, hello and the diverse mixes did a better job. So the question then was, well, can we understand why that's happening? What were the legumes not doing? What were the cereals doing? So simply, the cereals produced, so we, as cover crop biomass increased, so as there's more green leaf above the ground, which is also a kind of a measure of how much resource the plants have taken around them and turned into plant matter, um, as you get more of that, you get less weed biomass. And what you can see from the colours here is that the cereal mixes and the diverse mixes were more able to produce more biomass um, and therefore there were less weeds. Um, however, what I did look at is whether if you had a high biomass, <coughs> say the cereals group, if that high biomass also had a higher diversity, was that more effective? 
And unfortunately, we found no evidence for that in this trial. Um, and then we were interested in whether this biomass was related to how we'll we be using the resources. We found that early in the season, if cover crop biomass was higher, soil nitrogen was lower. So that implied that cover crops were taking up the soil nitrogen <coughs> and the weeds were then not able to use the nitrogen for their own growth. And then later on in the season, where the cover crops produce more biomass, that allowed them to produce more canopy and shade the ground or shade out the lower areas. And so the weeds, again, had less light available to continue their own growth. So cereals seem to be very good at capturing resources very quickly. Diverse mixes, not worse than the cereals, but not necessarily any better. <coughs> um, and then, yeah, so this was just to prove that weeds relate to the, the resources as well. So where there was still more soil nitrogen, there were more weeds. And where there was more light availability, in these blue legume mixes, again, there were more weeds. Um, we could predict 50% of the weed biomass, 50% of the variation in weed biomass based on that, which is quite, quite a big effect on weeds. So what we learned from that is that the most important thing about a cover crop for weed suppression is how much resource it can grab and turn into biomass. We didn't find that diversity had a beneficial effect on this, so having more species doing more different things in different ways didn't seem to be beneficial. It seemed to be better just to pick the species that were, we already knew were good at doing that. However, um, other studies have found that if you mix diverse species, they are more productive. There can be an effect on weeds. So something that we found here was that the legumes didn't really want to just get going. Maybe it was to do with the climate that year. We had sort of dry, um, it was dry when we planted them, so it got too cold before they could get going. Um, a lot of the species are bred in Australia, not South Africa, so maybe they're not very adapted to um, South African soils. Legumes are super sensitive to herbicide residues. All of these things could have played a role. So it's possible that if we compose these functionally diverse mixes of species that were all very competitive, which were not available at this point in South Africa, we may have seen some additional effect of diversity. But more research to be done on that. It can also be that our, the way I you know, talk about those different um, canopies and root architectures, it's not a very precise measurement of how weeds are using the resources. So maybe there's more work for us ecologists to play with how that happens. So in conclusion for that, we, if farmers need to suppress weeds, they should be using productive cover crops. Um, they should be careful when using diverse cover crop mixes, which are good for many other things like um, providing multiple functions, so legumes might not suppress weeds, but they do fix nitrogen. Um, so people should be careful about what weed problems might result, depending on what mix, mix they're using. But we don't want to stop people using diversity, because it is good for other things. We just would like them to be careful with it, so they're not put off cover crops entirely. So, nearly at the end of this talk that's longer than I wanted it to be, to summarise all of those data chapters and what they meant for weeds, Remembering that the aim of the thesis was to develop these ecological methods that could uh, be used against herbicide-resistant weeds that didn't require herbicide use or soil disturbance, that are achieved with um, local crop species and tools, and can contribute to natural biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. Um, the first thing is if we look at the uh, studies that I did in terms of their ecological theory. Have I? No, I haven't animated anything. With the first, the vineyard study, we found that if we used weaker filters, we got more diversity. So this, um, you know, I'll talk about that with the slides that one. But if we used weaker filters, more diversity, and if we used a specific filter that selected against tall, fast weeds, then yes, we could get a more beneficial weed community. Um, if we increased crop and management diversity in time, then we, again, reduced weed abundance and increased weed diversity. So this was the diagram I showed you at the beginning. Increased filter diversity in space and time, uh, more weed diversity, less weed quantity. And these are the results from chapter four. Mm, no, they're not. Back. Um, plotted on the same kind of thing. You can see that is, you know, more or less the relationship that we found. Um, the dotted lines are things get better if you add livestock. Um, so yeah, this is something that it, this theory is true. And if we apply it to farming systems, we do get results. And in the last one, we found that. Reducing resource availability 
is effective in reducing um, weed abundance, um, but sadly we didn't find that diverse cover crops could, could help us with that. So in general, all of those things, if we add them together, if we use management that results in more, um, like a lower intensity of filters, so less disturbance and less resources, but a greater diversity of those filters and a greater diversity of resources, then you get more beneficial weeds and lower weed populations. So for South Africa's winter rainfall region, mowing is potentially a good tool, or grazing, depending on what's most suitable to your system. Um, if you integrate these different things together, whether that's livestock um, in between herbicide years, and maybe we can find something to replace those herbicides at some point, then you're going to get better control than if you just spray herbicides all the time. Um, and we should keep using cover crops, but we should be careful how we use them. All of these things do all of those things I wanted them to do in that they reduce herbicide and tillage reliance. These are all ways of managing weeds without those two um, control methods. They're all compatible with conservation agriculture, which is related. You don't need tillage, so you can put them in with conservation agriculture. They're all achievable in existing cropping systems, although it would be nice to do some more research on more competitive legume cover crops. And they all promote weed diversity, which is generally linked to diversity at higher trophic levels. And uh, mowing certainly allowed for more native weeds to persist in vineyards than the other methods did. So what this shows is that when you think about the system as a whole, it becomes possible to invent ecological solutions that don't have bad interactions with any part of that system. So you can invent, invent solutions that fit the whole system. If you use herbicides or any of these other like techno fixes that people are coming up with, something's going to adapt to them. So even you know all these ideas of robots with um, you know vision and they're going to be able to just blitz the weeds because they can tell them apart from the crops. You wait till all your weeds look exactly like wheat. It will happen. It always happens. They adapt really fast. The harvest weed seed destructors, which seem really hard to get away from. You know the seeds get ground up really small. How do you get away from that? Weeds just started dropping their seeds a month earlier. Two years later, there's resistant populations. So, and if you're not, if the weeds don't adapt, then a lot of these things are quite risky, and that we don't know what their effects are on people, the environment. So, if you you might break part of your system too. So, what I would say is, even if some of these things may be part of agricultural management, they should only ever be a small part, or they can only ever be a small part of a whole resilient system. Because if you try and make them a big part, they'll just stop working, or your system will stop working. Um, so at the moment, we don't know that much about how to design resilient agroecosystems, um, particularly when talking about weeds. Too many different farming systems, too many different environments, too many different weeds. But that just shows that but we do know enough that we should be doing it. Like, so research like what I was doing in my PhD is really valuable in taking these theories from ecology and turning them into things that farmers can actually use. And by doing that, we also learn more about the ecology of how agroecosystems function. This is a little picture that shows what we do know about weeds so far and how it could, in, in theory, be integrated into systems using different types of crops together that get rotated with different types of management in landscapes that are designed generally to suppress fast species and promote diversity of slower species. Um, <coughs> It's great doing all this research. It's not great if no one knows about it. So I have talked it. This is me talking to farmers for the Farmers' Day. Um, it was nice. People generally seem really enthusiastic about it. Like I said at the beginning, you've got these family-run farms. People are super keen to look after the land so they can pass it down. Um, everyone reads the Farmers' Weekly, the South African Farmers' Weekly. So we've published the one about sheep in there, about the integrated livestock systems. I will hopefully get around to writing the others for that soon too. Um, I'm still in touch with the researchers that I worked with in South Africa to do this, and they got really excited about ecology and sustainability. So hopefully that means that that type of work into things like cover crops continues. And in terms of scientific impact, I have published all those papers. PhD students, you can do it. 